I think people are kind of getting a little crazy in the market. Why is Tesla a trillion dollar company? Why is Bitcoin at 60,000? And it's probably a lot more helpful to be specialized and focused and be, you know, the, the only sober person in the room when the punch bowl is, is uh, you know, spiked out the wazoo and somebody put, you know, 180 proof Everclear in there and people are just <laughs> drunk, drunk off their minds. Welcome to the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. My name is Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and I'm your host for the show, which is all about investing in real estate, achieving financial independence, and doing more of what matters. Whether you're a brand new listener or a longtime listener, it's always an honor to have you here listening to another episode. The topic for today's episode is how to invest soberly when the market seems drunk. I know this is sort of a provocative title, but I've heard from a lot of you online and social media and our email newsletter and my and the students in the course that a lot of us have anxiety and nervousness right now about what's going on with the market. And it just seems like between bidding up properties, other buyers in the market or people you know, buying up and down in the stock market and cryptocurrencies, it just seems like there's a lot of craziness going on out there. And so how do you deal with that as an investor? Do you sit on your hands and do nothing? Do you actually do something in the market? Do you go buy properties? What are some fundamentals that we can focus on? And so in this episode, I brought on my friend, Travis Hornsby. He's the founder of a website called Student Loan Planner. He and his team there have helped negotiate billions of dollars or help consult with people who have billions of dollars of student loan debt, particularly people with over $100,000 in debt. So people are professionals who've gone to school for professional school. But he's also one of the smartest people I know and just a friend of mine who is, is good at thinking counter cyclically. When everybody else is doing one thing, how can you find the hidden opportunities that nobody's thinking about? Or if everybody's thinking crazy, how do you kind of think soberly and, and make, do things that are going to make sense and you're going to be happy you did 5, 10, 20 years from now? So that is the conversation I have with Travis. We get into what are those things for each of us personally. He has a little bit different approach. He's more of a uh, index investor and owns a business. Of course, I invest in real estate and also index funds. But I think you'll get two different perspectives that kind of come down to some similar premises in this conversation. So if you find yourself in that boat of being nervous, anxious about the market and how to approach it right now, this conversation is for you. Before we get to that segment, I want to do my behind the scenes segment, which I'm starting to do every single week where I share a business idea, something I'm working on currently in my real estate business or my business behind the scenes, just to share that with you. And this week, I want to follow up on what I talked about in the last episode. And if you didn't listen to that one, I talked about the fact that my business partner and I are selling a few of our rental properties. We have 110 units, so we're not selling all of them, but we're picking and choosing a few. We're selling them and we're going to generate revenue, pay taxes on that, and then use what's left over to pay off some debt on other properties. So a question might arise there. Why in the world would you pay off debt? We have really low interest rates today. There's inflation happening. That's just not a really good play if you want to build the most wealth, right, Chad? Well, you'd be right about that. And so I want to take a step back and explain why we would do that and why we feel it's a logical thing. Not that we're perfect or have the perfect approach, but this goes back to something I talked about in my book, Retire Early with Real Estate, which if you haven't read, I hope you'll check it out. You can get it on my website or go to Bigger Pockets, who's the publisher of that book, or, or Amazon. Um, but one of the principles I had in that book was that each of us is going on this financial journey, and it's almost like you're climbing a mountain. And so for most of us, if we're down at the bottom of the mountain or kind of lower on the mountain, our goal is to build wealth, is to grow our wealth. Maybe you have a $50,000 nest egg and you're trying to grow that to 500000 Maybe you have a $100,000 nest egg and you want to get that to a million or $2 million. But that's really the name of the game, is growth and building that wealth. And so for most of us, there's strategies you use to do that. So using leverage is a very reasonable strategy, especially if you do it safely, uh, to build wealth. But eventually you'll find yourself either towards the top of the mountain or maybe at a plateau along the way, where my, my argument in the book was that eventually you want to change strategies a little bit. It's not always about maximizing growth and getting as big as you can. It is actually about balancing that with reducing risk, with increasing your cash flow, and simplifying your life. And so a strategy to do that is to start paying off some debt, even if it's lower interest, interest rates, even if you could grow even more, because it's kind of like a poker game. If you ever heard, I'm not a big poker player, but the idea is if you have a lot of winnings, you want to take some of those off the table, you know, put those in your bag so that you at least have something to show for your efforts. And, and then you can still keep playing with some of the, um, the chips, but take some of those off the table. 
And so paying off debt is a very simple way to take chips off the table, to build some resiliency. So we like to think about, you know, most of the time, I mean, we, we, we're going to be fine in our portfolio if in 99% of the time, but maybe 1%, you know, what if we had a really big you know, deflationary scenario or something like that? We just, we don't want to slide back down the mountain. We've built what we're happy with and we have enough. And so we were more focused on increasing our income, which happens when you pay off debt because you free up that debt payment. You're also simplifying your life. I'm not using that money to go buy more properties and have to manage more of them or more, you know, more team members who manage them. Uh, we're just keeping what we have or even having less while also increasing our income while reducing our risk. So that's an argument for paying off debt. I'm not saying you have to replicate exactly what I do, but I do recommend at some point as you grow and as you think about what your risk tolerance is, what helps you sleep well at night, you consider paying off some or maybe eventually all of your debt on your properties as a strategy after you grow or even during the time you grow to do what we just talked about. Now let's get started with today's interview. Hey, Travis, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Chad, great to be here. So I don't know, this is a long time ago, but you, you hopefully you remember that you were my very first guest on this podcast. Like I was doing all solo episodes and then we, you know, exploded onto the scene here with the Travis Hornsby guest feature on the podcast and you, you kind of took us to another level. Well, I mean, it makes sense after I paid you a hundred thousand dollars to be, <laughs> you know, the first sponsored guest, right? Yeah, exactly. You, you, pull, you pulled out the big, the big bucks. I just dropped, so, I dropped, I dropped a hundred Bitcoin in your pocket and I was uh, like, oh, make me your first guest. Yeah. Back then it was like, it was very, I, I should have held on to that Bitcoin. I've sold it since then, you know? <laughs> I, yeah. I, you know, who knows? I mean, but I promised, you know, listeners I actually didn't pay Chad, even though I probably should have. Uh, I guess he had me on because his, uh, you know, judgment was lacking in that particular week. Not at all. So I, I, I'm going to, I've told people in the intro, Travis, that, that sometimes you're fortunate enough to have people in your circle of friends. And I call you my circle of friends who would be that person you would go to if you needed advice on particularly numbers, analytics, but really just a broad swath of like business advice. Travis is one of those small group of people that I would, I would call personally. So I just, I feel very fortunate to have you on here on the podcast. And, and I want to, I want to talk about debt. This is, this is a debt conversation. Uh, I told you that before we got on, jumped on the phone here that I, I talk a lot about paying off debt in this real estate podcast and that I use leverage. I love using leverage and debt to buy investments, but then at some point paying that, paying it off is a good idea. So I, I want to go into that. And this is your, your expertise in a way, and you, you run the student loan planner and which is all about helping people with a lot of debt, particularly professionals who've had student debt, student loans, pay off their debt, or figure out ways to, to get rid of that debt. But before we, before we go into that, I want, I want to just, can we tell your sort of your origin story? Like why, why student loan planner? Like where, where did that come from? Did you, how did you get into running that business? Yeah, I mean, my wife had a lot of student loan debt from med school and I pretty quickly learned about public service loan forgiveness back in about 2015 or so and realize, oh, what? oh my goodness, we could get six figures of this forgiven. I was excited. Mm -hmm. And so I helped her submit the documents for it. And then it came back saying that she had zero credit on some of her loans and partial credit on the others. And so I thought, oh my gosh. So I ran the numbers and realized she lost six figures from bad advice. Mm -hmm. And wow, like how terrible is that? I mean, that really set us back financially. Uh, and I thought this shouldn't happen to other people. And because I didn't see any tools out there that I thought were good enough, I made a spreadsheet, started consulting based on the spreadsheet values of all the different repayment options people had to pay off their debt, specifically student debt. And uh, that's how that's how Student Loan Planner was born. I mean, in terms of uh, listeners, you know, out there, you know, one of the problems or one of the big issues that people go through is they try to be broad. I, well, I was kind of broad. I had a broad personal finance website and I reached very few people. And then I started talking about one thing in particular that didn't have a lot of competition that I could be an expert in. And that's when my business really took off. So, you know, we'll talk about different strategies for debt payoff, but that's one quick tidbit that I've got for your listeners is, you know, you want to buy real estate or you want to be a real estate investor or something like that. Well, that's fine. But my question for you is how are you going to be successful? Somebody like you, Chad, you know, competes in spaces that the big institutional players might not be as interested in, but you do it in a place like Clemson, smaller town, a little more out of the way, not having as much New York institutional money to compete with. You have special market expertise in certain kind of rentals. Um, not, not a lot of people necessarily are doing that. You know, and, and you know, it's just amazing to me how like dentist doctors sometimes they say, oh, I wanna buy real estate. Well, it's like, wait a second, who out there can own real estate 
in a dental practice. Not very many people, but you right. can, and you have a special competitive mode around that. And meanwhile, you're trying to go compete with hedge funds buying multifamily apartment complexes. Like that doesn't make sense necessarily. <laughs> Yeah, such a good point. And I, I've actually gone from the big city of Clemson. Like I still own in Clemson, but if I the, the, the more of the opportunity in my area is the little small towns next to Clemson, like the Central and the Pendleton and the Seneca. So to your point, you've got to go in the ponds where not as many people are fishing, right? That's the, whether you're doing that in the blogging space like you've done or the, the online space or the also the real estate space and the investing space and or the dental office space. My parents bought a dental office. My mom was a dentist and my parents together, the first real estate they bought, I believe, was the dental office underneath their, their practice. Like two really rich guys that I met one time in, at a financial conference bought distressed like tax lien sales mm -hmm. or something like that. And these guys were like, the world's experts in that for like the rural Midwest. And they knew all of the county like recorders and they knew all of the auctioneers and they knew like they had all these connections. And then they literally drove their F 150s around all these rural counties, like in rural Iowa, and would be like one of two bids on like some random distressed, uh, you know, $30,000, uh, you know, mobile home or something like that. And they would yep. get, you know, they, they were tremendously successful doing this because nobody else would compete with them. So uh, I think you have to think unconventionally sometimes to be unconventionally successful. So that's the same tip I've got for debt is people always think about debt with this tired one size fits all type of advice on it. And I want to show people there's a lot of other ways to think about it. They can get you to your dreams a lot faster than that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I want to go there. I want to take one more step back with your history because I think it's relevant. You, when at the time you were helping your wife figure out her student loan debt, you were you were working for Vanguard, right? You were in the and if I, if I remember right, you were in the the, the bond department, so where the where people are trading bonds and in for people who don't know anything about the bond bond market is the debt market. That's, so in a big way, you were all in on on understanding debt from the beginning. Um, what what are the qualifications or what what kind of skill sets do you have to have when you're analyzing debt on a major like institutional level? Is, is this back to your spreadsheets? Is that is that one of the important criteria you had to have at that point? Well, I mean, yeah, so so you would see, um, you know, you get notifications on your phone when somebody text messages you. Well, mm -hmm. we would get maybe like maybe 20 of those a minute. And all of it would be on different kind of messages from other kinds of banks about what's going on in the market. So, you know, the stock market, look at CNBC or Google or something, you can, or even like a Bloomberg gap, and you can see the stocks you chose go up and down and you know exactly what the prices are. Well, in the bond market, it's totally opaque you don't exactly know what the price of a bond should be. And then sometimes, you know, market participants will send out a quote and tell you what the bid ask is on a particular kind of bond. And so your job as a bond trader is to follow that, but then follow 10 other things going on at the same time. So that when your portfolio manager says, hey, I need to raise $10 million for redemptions today, you can say, well, I saw a really strong bid out there for New York City general obligation bonds. I think we could get this price. And, you know, if they think that that's a good price relative to historical averages, then we'll go out and try to sell $10 million of New York City GOs to raise $10 million to, re you know, to meet redemptions for the fund investors that are trying to sell and acquire cash. So how do you do that at scale? That's the challenge. So there's a lot of guys that were old school guys that would be able to just have amazing memories to look at all these streams of information and make decisions on the fly. And then kind of younger guys like me, Kind of shortcut that and said, well, maybe if I make Excel macros and Excel programs, like I can look through a million bonds and I can see if there's a particularly strong bid relative to historical averages with a bunch of formulas where I look up those historical prices and everything. And yeah. so that's what I kind of did. And to whatever extent that I had success in that, that's I think kind of what my comparative advantage was, is I was better than average at programming in Excel, just kind of as a, as a need to do it. Like I needed to right. do it to be successful in the job. And the, the valuable part of that was learning how to program in Excel to analyze complicated financial questions, mm -hmm. because I certainly can't program in C++. I can't program in any other useful languages. Uh, all I can do is do a little bit <laughs> in Excel, but that's enough to make a difference yeah. uh, because not a lot of people can do that, you know, the way, the way that I was able to learn how to do it. So I took yeah. that skill and like, that's more of an institutional level skill for institutional investors and then apply it to my wife's debt issue with student loans because there was so many different options for her to pursue not just paying it back she could go for forgiveness yeah. so um so that's kind of that's kind of the, the the long and short of it is you know modeling to analyze a million rows of data 
with 30 columns each was yeah. a necessity. So that's how, that's why I learned it. And so you helped your wife and you, you helped her figure out, kind of get a handle on that. And then since then, both you and now you have a team of people who've consulted with, you know, I guess thousands or maybe more than that, of people who have a lot of debt and you've helped them model their situations. One question I have for you, having all that experience talking to so many people who have debt on their mind and they're trying to figure out how to either, you know, get it settled or paid off or whatever. Are there any commonalities that you have seen in the strategy? You said there's different, there's not a one size fits all strategy, but like, I, th I would assume most people are like, all right, I just want to solve this problem. This debt's kind of hanging over me. Like there's some anxiety there. Like maybe we could just talk for people who out there who all, all of us at some point are probably in debt to some extent. So like, what, what are some of the commonalities you're finding from a person, from the people you're talking to out there? Well, some debt is strategic and some debt is an anxiety inducing heart attack waiting to happen. Right. And so I think that the, the way I look at it is taking debt from something that is causing mental stress and strain to something that doesn't have to affect your mental health and doesn't have to affect your life anymore. Yeah. So that means that di means different things for different people. You know, some, some people, their stress is the interest rate, man, if I could get my interest rate lower, I could make more progress on the principal balance and make all the difference for me. So that kind of a person, we we're going to help them figure out how to refinance and get the lowest interest rate. You know, if somebody is more, wow, this payment is a whole lot and it's eating up into other things that I want to do. Well, there's probably a reason for that. Sometimes it's overspending, but more often than not, it's because their income's not high enough for the debt that they borrowed for their school. Right. And so maybe you need to get a lower payment and sometimes you need to adopt a different strategy altogether. You can't really do this as easily for real estate, but you can go for forgiveness-based plans in the student loan market where you get it at basically set up as a percent of your income, which makes it a lot more affordable. But um, but you can, you can change debt around in the real estate markets too. I'll, I'll just yeah. give a personal example that uh, I dealt with this this weekend. So my buddy and I, we went on this camping trip and he's kind of sharing that all of his debt payments really stressing him out. Well, I knew that he had owned his home for about five years and in a kind of a high growth market. So I said, well, what's your interest rate on your mortgage? And he said, 4%, right? And so I said, okay, wait a second. So what's your mortgage amount? And so it turns out his mortgage right now is only for about 50% of the home's uh, value because it's gone up so much. And he's had a few car loans, a small student loans, some other stuff going on that, that he had to take out money for repairs in the house. So I said, okay, well, and I think he also maybe even had like an FHA type of loan too. So I said, okay, well you can refinance into a conventional and consolidate all that debt, you know, into one because he's not taking the real estate deduct interest deduction on his mortgage anyway. So roll that up into there and take your payment and cut it in half. And now he doesn't have stress anymore because he's not going to be living paycheck to paycheck anymore. Right. And then he starts crying, you know, yeah. and, you know, and he's like, you have no idea what this means because I, we got a small kid and, you know, they're struggling to, to make ends meet with all the expenses associated with that. And, you know, some people might say, Travis, you wicked man, you reset their loan and got them additional closing costs. And now they're paying for 30 years again. But I, the way I look at it, as I say, well, what was the problem there? The problem is that he was stressed out and that his payment was too high. And, you know, you can set it up so that if he sells the house, he can still walk away with enough money to put a down payment on a new one. But he fixed the cash flow problem, which allowed him to consolidate all these other debts sort of into one to give him space to save. Right. So the way, I, the way I look at it there is the goal is not debt freedom. The goal is that debt anxiety would be eliminated. Hmm. And there's many ways to do that a lot of which involves figuring out a way to lower the payment and, and, you know, in a way that makes it so that you don't have to worry about it. If you can sell an asset and walk away with a positive gain, then it's not really debt. It's a strategic debt. Yeah. I like, I like the, the distinction you made earlier, Travis, there, there's debt that is strategic. There's debt that is anxiety inducing. And it sounds like there might be some personal, you know, input into that equation as well. But do you, do you have a, I, I'm, I'm thinking on the line of like pe people ha out there have personal debt. So we're talking about credit cards, we're talking about car loans, we're talking about student loans. And in my world, you know, a lot of people have real estate debt, which is your buddy's example was a home. But if you have an investment property that's worth 200,000 and you have a $120,000 loan on there and the income from the property covers that plus a nice cushion, I'm pretty comfortable with that debt, especially if it's a 30 year fixed type mortgage. So like in my mind, I distinguish those are like on the opposite ends, like a credit card at 12%, 
that's going to revolve and is, is going up on the balance all the time versus a real estate debt. But would you, how would you, is there any kind of logical distinction between strategic debt and debt that is anxiety inducing that needs to be dealt with? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, some people are sort of pathologically worried about everything and, and that, and that's kind of more of a deep seated issue, right? Like that's one thing that I I'm realizing more and more of is a lot of times when people are worried, they're not actually worried about that, that thing. They're worried about something deeper than that. Yeah. Right. So if you're worried about your debt, maybe what you're really worried about is I don't like my job and I have no choice but to keep working because if I don't keep working, then I'm not going to have the money to pay my debt and then I'm going to lose everything and my life's going to fall apart. And so the worry there is that I put myself in a trap where I can't get out of my job and I'm stuck and I have no agency over my life at all. Yep. Well, that, that means that if that's the, if that's the worry, well, what you got to do is give yourself some breathing room. Maybe you reduce the payments, maybe you figure out how to restructure things, things like that. But you know, I don't know, like when I look around right now and think about interest rates at 3% and inflation's at six, you know, and the, and the value of, um, property has been increasing rapidly because of that inflation. Um, there's a reason it's like the federal reserves pump priming 120 billion a month <laughs> into uh, bond markets. And, you know, for a lot of people that are income investors, why wouldn't you be strategic in a market like that? And maybe if you've owned property for several years, restructure a lot of that with fresh 30 year refinancings to lower that required debt service payment down to as low as number of, as possible to maximize the income, the net income from those properties uh, to get yourself towards financial independence faster. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I, I, th I thought of a lot about most of the people I'm talking to here in the real estate space, many of them are in the growth phase. And so I, I kind of distinguish between, hey, you're in the, you're trying to build wealth. Like, what's your objective here? Your objective is to build this portfolio of properties and other investments that grows to the point where you can live off of it. So you have financial independence. They're a smaller number, but I've kind of found myself in this this camp as well where, okay, I've climbed up the mountain. I have enough net worth. Now, what is my main objective? My main objective is not losing that that wealth I've built in the first place. And so then, so I think what, what I'm hearing you say is that you got to think about two things, or more than two things, but there's two big things. What's your goal? What's your objective with your personal money, financial situation, and your psychological situation as well? We all have those. And then also, what's the environment in the overall market right now? We're in an overall market that has really low interest rates, high inflation. This is new, you know, inflation. Wow, we haven't had this in a long time. Um, and so we've got to think about that strategically. And you've also, but then you got to place your own personal situation in there. Where are you in this wealth building journey? And let, let's talk about the people in the growth phase, though, because I think that's where most people are going to be. You mentioned why wouldn't you take advantage of this, you know, this arbitrage is what we can call it. You know, you can borrow money at 3%. If you have a rental property that produces 6% in income, plus you have 4 to 6% inflation going on in the background, if it can keep up with that, that's a, you're, you're talking about a really good return on your down payment when you're making money on the, the debt, the income on the debt, and you're making money on the inflation of the asset underneath it. Like maybe tell, tell me, what's your, what are your thoughts on that kind of that approach to investing? Yeah. I mean, I, I'll say like, if you, if you ever have a situation where you're expecting assets to continue to inflate, then having fixed debt is a great decision, right? Because you're going to make a positive return on any kind of assets that go up relative to debt you have. Right. Um, I'll say that like for me, for me personally, we could pay off our mortgage in cash if we wanted to. I haven't done that. And one of the reasons is because the investments out there that people want to make seem to be always in something else that they have no control over that's going to go to the moon. Well, what my counterpoint to that is, is the best investment you can ever make is in yourself. So, you know, I'm holding that money back because I'm realizing that probably one of the best investments that I can make personally is in my business because that's where I'm getting bigger returns than in the stock market. Um, and then plus I'm not hundred percent sure exactly what my tax bill is going to be with all the tax bill negotiations going on. So I'm holding back some money for that to make sure I don't cause myself stress with a bill that I can't afford to pay right at the end yeah. of the year. Um, so I don't know, that's not a perfect answer to your question, but I, I think that, you know, I think people are kind of getting a little crazy in the market. You know, why, why is Tesla a trillion dollar company? Why is Bitcoin at 60,000? You know, why is, uh, you know, Donald Trump's um, SPAC or whatever that kind of thing was, you know, why did it go up 300% in the first day with no, no revenue? This is not a normal market. This is a market that is nuts because of very low interest rates and 
just, I think, pandemic-infused uh, gambling and rage yeah. of being stuck, unable to do many things that we've taken for granted. Uh, you know, and so it turns out if you give people a ton of money and ha don't have enough suppliers to meet that demand, that money's got to go somewhere. Yeah. And I think it's it's going into, in many cases, speculative gambling. And so that's the phase of the market that we're in right now. And so if that's going to continue to result in inflation, like there's two things that can happen, right? Stable prices or deflationary prices or inflationary prices. Are we going to have deflation? Almost certainly not. It's possible, but it's very unlikely because the Federal Reserve can keep printing money if they want to, if that happened, right? So are we going to have stable prices? I don't know. If we're going to have increasing inflationary prices, real estate values could go down, right? But but probably, I would imagine, rents would probably stay a little bit more stable. So I don't know. You're the property expert, not me, but I would say, you know, go, go. I mean, I think right now within a, like the way you invest, Chad, I know is a little bit more conservative on leverage, but I think if you can use leverage conservatively, I would say go for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to go back to the, if you feel like the market's crazy, which I would agree on that one, like there, there's some things going on out there that I don't understand. And I'm not claiming to ever under, like even 2000, seven, eight, nine, I wasn't the one like ahead of the curve predicting things. I, I feel like I had some good instincts on how to prepare for that. And that's sort of where my mind is right now. Let's prepare for that. Potentially, you know, deflationary cycle is a very small chance in my mind as well. Although I don't know, like who knows? And, and then the stable or going up is probably more likely. So, so what I try to do, and this is, you feel free to critique this, like the, I, I could try to go back to the fundamentals of whatever investment I'm investing in. You're investing in your business. That makes sense. You understand the fundamentals, fundamentals of that pretty well. That's a Warren Buffett tenant, you know, invest in what you know. In real estate, what I'm, what I'm putting out there is that if you're growing your wealth, given what we see out there in the market, still focus on income. Like that to me is always kind of like the, the guiding star. That's harder to find properties that have cash flow that makes sense. But I'll give you a real simple example. If you can buy a property that if you, let's just assume you paid cash for it. You're not going to pay cash. You're going to get a debt on it. But let's just start with that. You, you spend uh, $200,000 on this property and it can produce $12,000 per year, net, 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 after paying all your expenses. So that's a 6% yield on the, on the income on that property. So if, if you didn't have a debt, you just pay 200,000 bucks, you would make 12,000 a year. But then you go out and borrow part of that, let's say 80% of that purchase price. So you had to put you know forty thousand down. And you borrowed one hundred sixty grand, and you were able to borrow money at three percent. Let's just keep the numbers around. Maybe it's three and a half percent. That if you can fix that three and a half percent debt, and you're making money today. So like whether the property went up in value or not, you are making a spread between the six percent your property produces and the three to three and a half percent your debt costs you. That's a, that's a built-in long-term profit. And then as prices go up, if rent goes up, great. You're going to make a larger spread. If the price of the property goes up, you've invested 20% down and now you're going to make, you know, some money on that leverage. That's kind of the basic formula for grow, growing your portfolio and still kind of looking through all the chaos and saying, all right, what's the formula that works? That's what's always worked for me is borrowing at a cost that's less than what I'm buying a property that can produce. Well, that makes sense to me. Like what, what I'm concerned about is, is stuff I'm hearing like this, like, Oh, I made a, I make a ton of money participating in limited partner real estate deals, right? Mm -hmm. Or I go onto these pla real estate platforms and they have this complex they're working on that's promising a 15% IRR for luxury apartment building that, you know, I'm I'm invested, you know, 50,000 on and it's a limited time deal for and I'm, I'm expecting an exit in 2 years or something. Like that's that's fine, but the kind of deal that you described, Chad, is a stick to the ribs deal. Like that's something that's not going anywhere. If the economy, you know, tanks, it, you know, you built a margin of safety into your investment. Whereas, you know, what I'm concerned about is nobody at all is paying attention to risk right now. Like it's mm -hmm. just the last thing in the world that anybody's thinking about. Who cares about risk? That's not going to affect me. I'm invincible. That's what everybody's mentality is right now. And so people, you know, I guess in investing more generally, but like and anecdotally from real estate investing that I'm hearing are just pouring money into these very illiquid, you know, sort of, I don't want to call them schemes because they are investments. Like they, they do actually own property, but it, it, to me, it feels very, you know, ex just extremely risky because you have no control and any kind of economic turnaround or, or, or a drop could like make it almost impossible to, to get money out of this stuff. Yeah, so 
the, the reason I, I'm with you on those, and I, I mean, most of the people I'm talking, I mean, I have people who are investing in limited partnerships, but a lot of what we're talking about here is buying directly, buying your own property. Right. The, pro the problem I have, I mean, every real estate deal has some risk, and let's talk about some of that. But the deals where you have to have A, B, C, and D happen, like you have to buy this apartment complex, you've got to spend, you know, ten thousand dollars per unit to remodel them. They're all going to be vacant during that time. You then have to raise the rents from a thousand dollars to $1,400 per month. And then you also have to refinance it. So, I mean, there's like three or four major things that have to happen in order for these 15 to 20% returns to happen. Um, and then you have to pay a bunch of fees to the people who are developing the property too. Like that, that there's too many A, B, C, D kind of things to connect there to the, the more that ha that has to happen, the more speculative it is, and that and so let, let's talk about the risk because I, I think I'm with you 100. percent Like, and th this goes back to our debt conversation too. In real estate, I see the risk uh, debt being the the biggest risk. Like, I, I'm not a I'm not a Dave Ramsey, Ramsey disciple, but I do respect like the message of debt being something we should respect and be concerned about, and this have some healthy respect for. So when I was investing as a young investor in 2007, eight and nine, the only way I saw people go out of business was they couldn't make their mortgage payments. Either the monthly payments got too high compared to what their rents were, or they had a balloon note where they had a bunch of money come due and they had to pay it off. Like I've, I've seen so many people go out of business in real estate and regular business from that, from that. Like I have, I know people go out of business cause they got sued from their tenants. I know I'm sure that's happened. I've never heard anybody have happened. I'm sure there's other reasons, but like debt to me is like the only thing that's, killed businesses and killed investors. So what, what do you think? Like what, where, where so we're, we're all being too risky. People are being too risky. Like where, how, what are some ways this could blow up for people? Well, greed, right? Like you have greed and fear. Those are the two big mo emotions in investing at all, you know, in general. And right now, you know, usually in most times there's a mix of greed and fear yeah. where, you know, you've got X percent greed, X percent fear. And right now in today's market, we've got maybe 1% fear, 99% greed. <laughs> uh, and you know, so, you know, like those quotes about be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. It's like another Buffettism. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people would say, wow, he's so out of style now because look at all these tech companies that have gone to the moon. And meanwhile, everybody who's owned any kind of value stock has just gotten pummeled. Well, that's true. And that's going to be true until interest rates go up at some point. And we're starting to see that a little bit. Uh, but you know, the thing that will destroy tech valuations is not going to be tech companies not doing that well. It's going to be higher interest rates that reduce the future value of their profits in today's dollars because of just discounted cash flow analysis, right? Mm -hmm. So that that's not dead. It's just right now it's out of favor. Um, so when you're making a decision on how to invest and how to think about your debt, you know, 15% interest debt with balloon payments is super different. Uh, back that's what they had like, you know, 80s, 90s or something. Actually, the guy that built our house, I kind of found this a little awkward, but like he actually like ended his own life and uh, years after he built our home. And the reason is because he had all these luxury homes in a uh, high interest rate environment in the 80s. And then I think that's when they raised interest rates or something. And, uh, and I, he might have had it on variable debt or something. And the debt payments just destroyed his finances and he had to declare bankruptcy and sell his, his company um, and just couldn't take the stress. So I think that's the, that, that's the key is, is a you know, a 30 year fixed rate at 3% where you own significant equity in your property, uh, you can easily cover, you know, expenses and have a good positive yield like you're describing. I think that's great. You know, I think that's a good situation to be in. The, the you know, super illiquid, limited partnerships, the stuff that sounds too good to be true. Uh, you know, that's the stuff that worries me, honestly, because I think it's just a, an outcropping of just people have so much money and, and anything that people have thrown, you know, it's like the more speculative you invested in, the more money you made the past two years mm -hmm. because of the way the pandemic worked out. And so is that the way the next two years are going to look like? Probably right. not. Right. Yeah. There's, there's some definite FOMO, some fear of missing out going on with, with, with investments and uh, I'll give you one example for me. <laughs> uh, I, I had I, I'm dabbling, just dabbling in some crypto stuff. I had some Bitcoin. I sold my Bitcoin a month or two ago because I'm paying some debt off. Like that's my strategy. My core strategy is like I'm paying debt. And and but then since I sold it, I sold it at forty two uh, you know, forty two thousand uh, dollars or forty two thousand per Bitcoin is now at like sixty five. <laughs> and so I tell my wife, I'm like, hey, uh, 
that Bitcoin I sold that was kind of at a break even for us, you know, it's now we just missed out on 10 or 15 grand and in, in rising prices. Isn't that interesting? And I'm fine with that because my decision was to pay the debt off. But that's the kind of thing I think you mentioned, like this, the, the more speculative you are. I'm not saying that's not a good investment either, but um, you know, there's there's stories out there right now that people are telling each other about. Look what so and so did with that certain investment that made that much money. Look what so and so did, and that's that's the spe- without f- focusing on the fundamentals of why do I think that investment's good? What's the long term strategy? How this is going to make money? That's what I'm hearing you say, right? Well, I mean, you know, people might listen to me and and think I'm an idiot because I missed out on cryptocurrency. I missed out on that trend, right? But I just went to this brewery in uh, the Smoky Mountains with some buddies. And I noticed that there's this huge table of older people, probably in their 70s, uh, sitting at this, and there was a bunch of them at this table, and they're wearing um, Bitcoin overalls and Bitcoin (laughs) hats. And they've got like little B sign like eyeglasses. And like everything they wear is decked out with like Bitcoin memorabilia, right? I mean, this is gonna end very badly. Like this is every story of, of every financial crash ever is, is, is when people go crazy, bad things eventually happen. Not tomorrow, not maybe next year. Right. But eventually some bad stuff happens. Um, you know, and, and, and how does it happen? I don't know, but, but I think that that's, that's why I think now more than ever, you, you want to be strategic. So for example, you know, I made a lot more money than people that invested in Bitcoin did by just focusing on my business, something that I can tangibly understand, something that I have a business plan for, that I provide a service and products for, you know, that I've have, you know, it's, it's, it's logical that I do X, I make money doing Y, whatever, right? You make money by providing housing to people. You have a core service that you provide and you get compensated for that risk that you take uh, handsomely compared to you know, random investments that you make. So that's what I would urge for people is, you know, lessen the impact of debt on your life by being strategic about your debt instead of just, freaking out about it. Right. And then for your investments, you know, do something that is investing in yourself. If you want to do that first and foremost. Um, so for, that means labor market, right? So either go out and take your own risks or change your job, maybe quit your job and look for another job. You know, my buddy, the same buddy that I was helping with the mortgage refinance has not gotten in more than an inflation level raise in 10 years. Why is that? It's because the vast majority of labor market gains happen when you change jobs and leave your company and go to a new one, right? So a lot of people need to have that be the focus in terms of investing in themselves. And then secondarily, like if you're going to make investments, I would say make it in broad market index funds or do it in something that you understand, like buying a direct house like you're talking about with all the courses, you know, the tenants you teach in your courses and your, your podcast. I mean, certainly if I was going to invest heavily in real estate, like I would trust you and your judgment of how to do things versus some super aggressive, you know, <laughs> sort of fly by night, like a uh, person coming to my city for a one day only special driving a Lamborghini. Right. right. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, it's sort of like, uh, I don't know. I just, I just, I just see everything going on and it doesn't make any sense. And that's, that's caused me to become a lot more conservative. So for me, I still have a lot of money invested, but I have a significant amount of cash to prepare for, whatever it is that might happen in the next few years. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I think the theme I'm hearing that I 100% agree with is when things feel crazy, you've got to find a formula or, or a strategy or two that you go with and you, that makes sense to you, that you understand. And that, that doesn't have to be real estate. Like I, I love, I mean, you're, you're, we are both kind of into the financial independence type movement and ideas. There's There's more than one way to accomplish this. There's people who are, much more strongly into index funds and that's their thing. There's people who are into businesses like you and I are both business owners. I'm, I love entrepreneurship and that's a great place. If you want to give yourself a raise, like that's the, that's the way to do it. Get a side hustle, turn that into a business. Like that's some of the best returns I've ever received have been in businesses. And then real estate's kind of a hybrid, you know, it's, it's part business, part investment. It's a startup when you begin, but it turns into a long-term passive investment over time. Those are, those are your tried and true options. You know, the, the index well, funds, the, real estate and then business. Yeah. Let's talk about go where they ain't. That's something we talked about at the beginning of, of the show, just talking about like business strategy, go where they yeah. ain't. In other words, like go compete in a place where you have a competitive edge. So you're yeah. talking about buying property in places around Clemson. So I, I'm going to give you an analogy for my bond trader days. So I remember that I needed to raise cash for the New York fund. And so one day I was asked to sell 
a um, bond for the New York Mo Metropolitan Museum of Art, right? And uh, the MoMA, right? So, um, so that's like super famous museum. It's a tax exempt bond. And there's this, you know, sort of benchmark yield where, you know, the AAA uh, bond would get, you know, say 3%. And then you trade a bond based off of how uh, much extra yield you get on top of the AAA curve. And that's, that's you know, how you trade bonds, right? So uh, a number that's really small above that AAA spread would be a very valuable bond. And a number that's very high would be a bond that gives a ton of yield because it's really risky. So I looked at the bond rating on the, um, that MoMA bond and I said, okay, well, uh, you know, this, this yields pretty good deal. So I'll sell it for this. And my portfolio manager came back and said, what'd you sell that bond for? You sold it for less than a, like the cost of a, or like the, a lower yield than even triple A's yield. Right. And I said, wait, what, well, what do you mean? Like, I don't get that. Why would, why would it sell for a yield even lower than the triple A curve? And he's like, because certain people will buy that bond for basically any yield because it says museum of art on it. So there's like, like, wow. l l like little old people out there that will just like see a bond that says New York Museum of Art, and they're like, oh, cool, I can get paid two percent, and it's got the Museum of Art that I go to every week on it. I want to buy a million dollars of that, and I didn't know that. I was just th thinking, okay, I sell it according to what the benchmark says, and so I cost the bond a ton of money. So I got, I, got, I was in the doghouse for that. I was in trouble. Um, but you know, nobody ever told me. So what I'm saying, I'm saying that story, right? Because what's going on in the real estate market right now, if you're a house, that's like 200,000 to 500,000 single family in a list of 30 specific Metro areas, uh, you know, a next door or a hedge fund or institutional investor is just going to come and offer cash. And they're just going to lift that house from the market. You're not going to have a chance to compete for buying that. Right. But in a out of the way location, like the towns around Clemson that you talked about, what are the chances that an institutional investor is gonna be paying attention close enough or that you're gonna be competing with one of those all cash offers from one of those hedge funds or institutional investors? Yep. The ch chance of that's way, way lower. So we're, we're also giving advice to say dentists on buying a practice. Any dental practice that's doing above a million dollars of revenue might attract private equity interest, which means instead of a multiple of, you know, 60% of sales, it might sell for, 100 to 150% of sales, and you won't be able to outbid them, right? So, but by focusing on practices that are lower than a million, you can get an amazing steal of a deal because the, the <laughs> I, I don't want to call them the big boys, that's, you know, the, that's the big players, right? The big players in the market are not paying attention, right? So that's that's kind of, I think, the, another successful strategy right now is, you know, go where they ain't. In other words, you know, if you're trying to invest in real estate, why would your bid have a chance at being accepted, even though you're not going to be the very best bid out there? Uh, because maybe you're you have a unique you know advantage that other people don't have, and, and you need to leverage that. Yeah, I'll give a couple more stories just to get people thinking about this "go where they ain't" philosophy. Um, sometimes it's the location of the property, so going in smaller towns, or I, I really like small cities out there right now. Like instead of going to the big metros, go to the town that has a hundred thousand people. Like Athens, Georgia, is an example for me. Like that's a really cool town that has you know I don't know hundred thousand people, but it has a big university. It's not going anywhere. Greenville, South Carolina. These are just ones I'm familiar with. Asheville, North Carolina is pretty cool. There's some cities in North Carolina that I'm familiar with. These are not, not like major. They're part of major metro areas, but they're not even the Atlantas, the Charlottes, the, you know, Washington DCs or the upper level kind of cities, New York, San Francisco, but they have a lot of like the spillover from those cities. And so that's a ge geographic kind of target. I think people should go to, but then even in those cities, like I'm talking about, go to the little outlying uh, metro areas. And there's this trend in, in real estate to find Serban locations, S-U-R-B-A-N. So instead of finding like people, a lot of the millennials wanted to live in urban areas, but now they're starting families, they're trying to buy a house. So they're, they're, they can't afford houses in the big cities. So they're going to these smaller cities that feel like big cities because they have walkable infrastructure because they, they, they have this some kind of quality that's urban, but they're still in a suburban environment where you can afford to actually buy a house. So th those are, that's my thesis right now for finding, for smaller investors finding good real estate. That's part one. The other part is, this is something we've done, my business partner and I for a long time, is the financing market determines a lot of the value. So the easier it is to finance a property, 
the higher that value is going to be. So like single family houses, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. That's the one reason I tell people to invest in those, but that's also going to be more competitive because lots of people can get financing on them. If you go on the, if you want to do the opposite of that, go to the piece of real estate that nobody can finance that like you have to pay cash for. And that's mo uh, mobile homes, for example, mobile homes. Uh, we used to uh, had a little niche of buying double wides on a piece of land out in the country somewhere, you know, with less than 10 miles from a city. So, but they felt like they're in the country. They got their little acre or two of land and it's a double wide and we might, we might buy a foreclosure double wide and fix it up. It, we had to pay cash for them. We would pay twenty to forty thousand dollars cash for these double wides, and then we would turn around and either flip them for seventy, eighty grand. But the thing is, nobody can get financing on them, right? Especially used mobile homes. So then we would owner finance those properties and get ten grand down, finance it for sixty thousand dollars at you know eight percent interest or something. So that's just one little niche. That's just an example, though, that you, you find something in the market that's the strength for mo that most people say that's what you should do: go buy the single family house. And then you do the opposite of that, go find something that nobody can finance, like a mobile home, like a piece of land. I know people buying land right now who are doing pretty well and they're flipping land and that's really hard to finance. That's not the typical thing that people want to buy. Uh, but that's, that's the example that I really like, appreciate you bringing that up because in a competitive market, you've got to, you got to zig when everybody else is zagging. That's, that's how you do it. Well, the thing that would scare me about that example would be that if that was the only one that you did. So like what I'm, what I'm hearing that would be super exciting about that is if you did a few of those, like that you really had tons of time invested in, and then you figured out the process of how do you scale that? So right. maybe I hire somebody that looks for deals. Maybe I have somebody that manages all the people that I hire to fix the, fix them up. Right. And mm -hmm. instead of doing, you know, one or two of those, maybe we can do, you know, a hundred of those or 50 of those or 10 of those in a year, you know, and in other words, try to make that where the investment of time and understanding that space is, is actually, you have a return from it. And right. then when you're seeking capital or you're, you know, giving advice to people or you're, you know, seeking partners or something like that, you're not just like, oh, I'm a real estate investor in this place. You're just like, well, I'm, you know, one of the top 10, you know, mobile home, you know, uh, owner financing companies in the Southeast, you know, niche area of this region or something like that. Right. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a cool business idea, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I think where people have a hard time is they, sort of are very broad. Uh, they don't get specific. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, this is random, but one of my buddies is an engineer sort of told me the other day, he's like, I don't know why, but my business always wants me to work on broad generic projects and doesn't want to let me become too specialized. And I'm like, I wonder why, right? Like, if, because <laughs> if you become too specialized, if you become the, the woman or guy that does X, well, then you have a way higher value to your human capital where you can just go off and make a competing company and make a ton of money. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. So you, you're going to spend a lot of time learning that niche. <clears throat> You've got to, you got to take advantage of it because a lot of the cost is up front and the knowledge and the, the, the doing of it. You got to, you got to find a way to leverage that. Well, you got to enjoy it too. I mean, if you hate going to rural places and you really don't like the, um, you know, dealing with, uh, evictions at all. And, you know, maybe that's maybe mobile homes is maybe not the space for you because you're going to have X percent of those because of people being in a certain income bracket. Right. So, mm -hmm. Um, also you want to minimize stress. It's another thing about minimizing debt stress is you got to make sure that whatever it bothers, whatever bothers you about it, that you're really careful to mitigate and eliminate that from your life. Right. Yeah. It's just not, it's not worth extra stress for extra money because it's just going to cause strain on other parts of your life. Yeah. So that's one thing that I'm, I battle through is like, I see business opportunities sometimes that I want to pursue, but then I'm like, wait a second, tap the brakes. This is going to cause more stress on me. And it's not going to be worth the extra money when I'm going to have stress that is just something that is not going to positively add to my life. Yep. So that's another suggestion that I've got for people. Yeah, very good. Well, I want to go full circle back to what we started talking about, Travis. And I think a lot of the idea of paying off debt is, is appealing. It's appealing to, to people because especially when you have that stress, you're starting with that stress component that's giving me anxiety. Sometimes you, you mentioned some good examples. It doesn't always make sense to pay it off. Maybe it's refinancing it. Maybe it's changing things up. But let's talk about when, when does it make sense for you just to bite the bullet, save your money, pay some debt off? Maybe do you have a couple of examples, people, because you work with a lot of people, like when, when, especially with the personal debt side of things, like when, when do you give people say, hey, here's a green light. Let's go, just go pay this debt off. So most people don't go out and try to earn more money. Most people have a job and they make what they make and they get inflation level raises. And so therefore they have a fixed pot of money. 
So the main gains financially that somebody's going to have are having a higher savings rate because people are not going to be brilliant investors in picking in the next Apple. So that means that any strategy or, or trick you can use on somebody to make them raise their savings rates is going to have huge returns. So a whole lot of the debt payoff mythology is in emotionally or psychologically tricking or even blackmailing somebody into paying off their debt and living on rice and beans by tricking them into having a higher savings rate. So debt payoff, that strategy and approach really works fantastically well when you've got somebody that struggles with overspending, doesn't do a really good job budgeting, needs some sort of reason to be frugal, and then now they have what a reason, get out of debt and eliminate this monthly payment that causes you stress from your life. Yeah. And so you sell out, you live frugally, you stop going on extra trips, you just focus single-mindedly on paying off the debt. That's good, but the problem is, is I don't think that makes somebody happier net-net. Like you pay off the debt and then your happiness level quickly reverts to whatever it is, whatever it was before paying off the debt. That's yeah. what my experience has been. So what, what that tells me is that people should focus on being happy now and try to identify a root cause analysis of what is making them unhappy and it's not gonna be the debt. It might be the, the need to work at a certain job to make the money to pay the debt. Well, then the problem is not the debt. The problem is your job and you need to be in a place that you're not miserable in. Maybe it's the hours you're working in a job. Maybe you like your job, but you wish you could work 30 hours a week instead of 40. It's amazing to me how few people think they have the power to tell their employer that. Like somehow telling them that you wish you work 30 hours a week instead of 40 hours a week and it gives you a scarlet letter. You know, it doesn't at all, right? Like in talking to my friend who wants to maybe cut his hours, I was like, well, pretty simple. Just tell them, hey, you know, people are not that productive on Fridays anyway. You know, in fact, I might even be more productive if I stopped working on Fridays. So give me slightly less money, keep me at full-time benefits. I'll do four days a week, you know, and then uh, I'll have more time to enjoy with my family. Yeah. So I think that's the key to me is, is the debt needs to be something that, you know, is paid off if it's bothering you, if that's your personality, but it's got to be flexible. The, the, the debt problem has got to mold to you and your life. The, the, the answer to every single thing in the world is not just oh, go pay off your debt any more than the answer to, um, you know, a cancer diagnosis is let's go do surgery and cut it out completely. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, certainly for some people, that's the way to go, but, but other people, maybe you do other, other approaches, maybe you do something different that's better for you. So uh, I just think that there's this overly uh, prescribed cure for this problem mm -hmm. that, you know, doesn't need to be taking away from people's lives as much as it is. So, and, and I would say like, this isn't devil's advocate, but this, it's not that somebody who goes on a debt payoff binge for the next two years doesn't have some worthwhile outcomes. It's not that they didn't learn to save money, which could be a positive outcome. It's not that they might have more flexibility now too, or they, they might have more confidence now because they went through that experience to make some of these changes we're talking about. But what I, what, what I agree 100% with is that like there's a root cause here. Like we're, we're not paying off debt just for the fun of it. We're not even investing in real estate just for the fun of it. Although I'm a nerd, I like it's fun for me. But like there's a, there's a reason we're doing all this. Like happiness, fulfillment, uh, peace of mind, better relationships with our, our friends and family. Like, so I, it's like give, giving up all of that in ex to do these other things, these tools, these are just tools, paying off debt, investing in real estate, it's just the tool, like for what? Like that's, that's the question I'm hearing you say, is like, is that gonna make you happier? Just paying off the debt? No, like not, not by itself. That's right, yeah, so I mean, in, you know, in, in terms of just bringing it full circle, so you, so you have debt. My push pressure to you would be, I don't wanna sound insensitive, but so what? You live in America, like, uh, something that hit home really hard for me is some of the people that have been tourists, tour guides for us, of like third world countries have been hitting me up on Facebook messenger being like, can you send money? There's no tourists here because of the pandemic. My family's going hungry. I don't have any resources because the government's not giving me enhanced unemployment benefits, you know, and, and plus they're having to deal with inflation as well because all the global supply chain problems because of rich countries like ours. So, you have debt, but you have the biggest asset in the world, which is being an American citizen. You know, I mean, I'm assuming maybe you have some international listeners, but most people that are listening to this are probably American citizens. So you have a huge opportunity and you only live once. And now is the most shocking time to be alive ever in terms of making wealth to give yourself options. I mean, 
you know, regardless if you're somebody that's making $15 an hour, they can quit their job tomorrow and go work someplace, make $25 an hour versus somebody that could go buy real estate, but you just got to get over the hump of taking the risk and getting that first deal and just trusting the numbers after going through a system to learn what you need to learn and taking the plunge and making a easy to understand, scalable, competitive advantaged business be your focus rather than I'm going to go find the next Shiba Inu coin, right? <laughs> I mean, if, you're, if your life solution to your financial trouble is, well, I'm going to go to Vegas and I'm going to bet it all on black. Well, that's not a strategy. That's just gambling. And, you know, eventually you're either going to end up broke or it, you're going to become a degenerate. So do you, <laughs> do you want that to be your, you know, your, your, your strategy, uh, you know, or do you want something that could transform your life and could create generational wealth for your family. Mm -hmm. So if you want generational wealth for your family, listen to Chad, you know, if you want to have to anonymously call the gambling addiction line, you know, go keep doing the investment speculation that other people are doing. Then you might make a lot of money, but just because you made a lot of money doesn't mean you were smart about it. It means you got lucky. Yeah. Love it. I love how you bring in the truth, buddy. You're uh, you tell it like it is and I think we need that right now. I'm just, I'm just, you know, as we wrap this up, I, just, I think sometimes the the crazier the news gets, the crazier change happens. Technology's changing fast, and it, it can be a little disorienting to to have that. But I, I just, I appreciate your voice of back to the basics when it comes to finance. Run your spreadsheets. All you need is an Excel spreadsheet these days, right? <laughs> just to get get the basic math done, and but also. What, what I also appreciate about you, Travis, is your message of you got to understand your own psychology. Like there's not a there's not a one size fits all strategy. There's a lot of great strategies out there. There's real estate and finance and financial independence, but a little bit of self-awareness of what makes you tick before you choose the strategy is is such a key component of this. And and so I'm, I'm, I appreciate that and appreciate this this idea that we're, we're in a place that has a lot of opportunity. Like that's my wife and I've traveled to Ecuador and we're lived in other countries as well. And they're for better or worse. I'm not saying there's, there's a lot of things that are worse here as well, but our economic opportunity finance wise, the finance system, the ability to get 30 year debt, even that, like I've got some Canadian students who are like, like, wow, you guys, you can get debt that's fixed longer than five years. That's amazing. Like even some basic things that are happening right now. So that's a different, that's a different way to look at debt. Like there's some opportunities here. If you Going back, if you use it well, if you buy assets that make sense, if you're not being crazy speculative with it, this is a, an, an incredible opportunity at the moment. So, well, I just want to, yeah, and I just want to say too, like so many of the discussions with finance that happen are so extreme. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, like, you know, Bitcoin's the next salvation or it's not, or the currency is running away and it's going to be worthless, right? Or, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of like extreme statements that are made. Yep. And if you really kind of think about it, that's, it's just not accurate. Like to, to, I mean, like the, even the, the, I don't know. I just, I just see all these kind of people like having these extreme statements that motivate certain kind of investing strategies. And, and it's probably not helpful to do that. It's probably a lot more helpful to be specialized and focus and be, you know, the, the only sober person in the room when the punch bowl is, is, uh, you know, spiked out the wazoo and somebody put, you know, 180 proof Everclear in there and people are just <laughs> drunk, drunk off their minds. I and mean, you're, you know, my, Younger brother is sending, you know, eggplant emojis every time he buys something in his brokerage account with his, uh, you know, unemployed actor money and he makes like 50% and stuff. And, you know, yeah, I get it. Like you say, oh my gosh, like I should get in on this. And, you know, I don't want to be the only person left out, but, uh, you know, just know that, you know, long-term you're going to win the race listening to Coach Carson on this podcast. You're going to be very wealthy listening to Coach Carson on this podcast. And you just have to, trust the sober advice, even when it seems like it's the stupid grandparent, you know, don't listen to cool music, you know, anti-dance footloose crowd, right? You, you've got to, you've got to like realize like sometimes like that's the right thing to do. And, and, and if it takes five to 10 years for that advice to be right, well, that's how, that's, how, that's the kind of time frame you want to be thinking about becoming rich. And uh, you know, the short-term stuff, you either start your own business uh, or, you know, uh, you know, or, or, or yeah, you go bet it all on black, but just know that you might be going home with nothing too. Yeah. Well, Travis, I invited you on the podcast and I've got my self-confidence boosted up as well. So 
I, I appreciate that. Um, so, so my final question here, I believe I asked you this before, but we'll see what you say now. So th- this, this is a show about financial independence. It's a show about, you know, whatever that means for people having more flexibility and options in their life. But a lot of people listening to this are going to be early in their journey. You know, they're just, they're just first getting their first deal or two done or their first, they're starting to save more money. Do you, do you have any, any final advice for those people who are kind of early in their journey, trying to find motivation, trying to find a foothold and what they, you know, what, what, what you would you tell them? I would say like, if you're interested in real estate investing, lock down like one to three direct deals, try to get, you know, maybe six months cash in the bank, six to six months to two years cash in the bank, plus say a hundred thousand of liquid net worth uh, on top of that. So, um, and if you do that, what I would suggest is if you don't like your job, quit your job and try to figure out some sort of interesting business you could get involved with. And if you do like your job, keep doing what you're doing and just keep on that steady drum beat in that march, right? So that's kind of the the two iterations. I would say, you know, when is an asset milestone to celebrate? You know, a c- couple years cash in the bank plus 100K liquid net worth. That's something that somebody who's in their 20s could hit before they're 30 and most any job that you're, you're in. And then once you hit that milestone, know that that frees you up to do something super aggressive with your life. And that's what I did. I quit. It t- took me two years to come up with a good business idea but now that business idea pays a lot more than when I was working for the man. And I'm going to send people to episode 47. So it was one of our most popular episodes when we did that, Travis. And the, the topic was why you shouldn't wait to take risks in life. So exactly what you just said there. I love it. There's a good strategy, a good walk away tip. Uh, I'm going to put links to Student Loan, loan Planner in, the, in the, the show notes. But is there any other things you want to tell people about, about what you're doing with Student Loan Planner? Just a little bit about what you, got, what you have going on and how you might be able to help people who could use your service. Yeah. So payments and interest start again, January 31st for federal student loans. That's going to have big implications for people. Uh, so if you are one of those people, you might need a plan. So check out studentloanplanner.com slash help if you need a, a plan from us. Um, you know, and I would say, uh, you know, for those other people out there uh, that maybe have private student loans, you can refinance those to lower rates. You can do so much with that. So just check out the student loan planner podcast. That's probably the, the best way to find us since you listen to podcasts like this. So just check out Student Loan Planner and anywhere you download podcasts and follow our show. Uh, and there's other huge updates happening, like massive loan forgiveness for public servants that's going on right now. So there's all kinds of stuff with student loans that if you do happen to have those, follow our podcast and, and you'll get all the updates you need. I can't re- recommend Travis's resource highly enough. I've just gotten to see behind the scenes of what he does. It's just incredible, both from the just the tools on your website, Travis, but also the ability to have somebody talk to you about your student loan plans when it feels a little overwhelming and it's complicated. And you, you know, you rattled off those things like they were, you know, you, you know, I'm like the back of your hand, but there's uh, for anybody who finds themselves in there in that kind of situation where you do have a lot of student debt, this is the, this is the resource to go to. There's no, you can't find any better, any resources out there. So Travis, thank you for your time. Really enjoyed talking to you and talk to you soon. Thank you, Chad. If you'd like more details on today's guest or the resources that we discussed, you can find a link to the show notes for today's episode in the podcast description on your podcast player or in the video description on YouTube. Until next time, I'm Chad Carson. You can also call me coach. I'm your host for the Real Estate and Financial Independence podcast, which is all about helping you invest in real estate, achieve financial independence, and do more of what matters. See you next time.